So the nail in the coffin in my sort of general hope in institutions was actually not my alma mater's denial of my basic human rights as a queer person. That's a story that some of you are familiar with. Um, but actually when they cut the theater program halfway through my degree, there were two majors in my entire class of 2020, including myself and two very, very dedicated theater professors who tended to their little flock of thespians. There was Jen who by all accounts should be a lesbian and is not, um, and a self-professed weird old white guy named Paul. We gave a lot to the life of the university and with very little thanks and with very little resources in a very Jersey Grotowski kind of fashion. We were given very little notice that our program was being cut and were informed in a mass email from the president co-signed by the vice president of academic affairs. It said something to the effect at the end, um, something to the effect of the world needs, insert name of my alma mater here, we have to be good stewards of what God has given us. And I remember responding to that email in my indignation and in my anger, something to the effect of, insert name of Liz's alma mater here, could crumble and fall into the sea and God will still be on the throne. The world doesn't need this institution. The world needs Jesus. The death of the theater program was uh, one of a number of assaults in the last couple of years at this particular institution on the humanities and also a physics minor I did not even know that we had. The year after I graduated, the faculty passed a vote of no confidence in the same vice president of academic affairs who drives a BMW while the children of full-time faculty qualify for free and reduced lunch. The vote was ignored by the president. The year after I graduated, they eviscerated the English department and started an engineering program. My senior year, however, before I left, Paul, my professor, spoke at convocation, perhaps as a consolation to all of us who are harmed by the budget cuts. And I remember going to the McDonald's across the street from campus uh, with him the day before. And I remember, I remember recognizing later at con convocation the parts of the speech that he seemed to be sort of casually rehearsing with me at McDonald's. He talked with the cashier about the upcoming Tigers game. He was in really bright spirits for a man whose theater program he'd built from the bottom up was gasping out its last breath. The one thing I remember from his convocation speech was this. And I want you to remember it like I do, because it got me through that really hard last year of my degree. Hope is the purpose behind your persistence. Remember that. So today's reading from Luke is actually paired really well with a text from Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, which we did not hear. It's from chapter 33, verses 4 through 16, and I'd like to read it now, if that's okay. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days, at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout up from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord, our righteous savior. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Um, this reading is often interpreted as being written about Jesus, though it was not. This text is, was important to Jesus because of his religious and his ethnic identity. Jeremiah was written about the Babylonian exile of the Jewish people. Jesus knew this text, and it had personal relevance to him as belonging to a people in occupation under an empire that some of us will never be able to relate to. This text, according to commentaries on the book of Jeremiah, is asserting the validity of both the institutions of the monarchy, the line of David, and the priesthood, despite the circumstances in which Jewish, the Jewish people found themselves, despite the fact that their king had been exiled from Babylon, as well as most of their leading citizens, and the temple was destroyed. The text of Jeremiah speaks to the validity of these Jewish institutions. However, the text in Luke in the text in Luke, Jesus points his followers to a different understanding of institutions, not better, not worse, just different. 
And the gospel reading today, the passage that Foster read, is situated in a passage where, in Luke, where Jesus talks with his disciples, not just about the destruction of the temple, but also the destruction of Jerusalem. It's almost kind of funny the way that he does it. Somebody says, wow, look at these jewels. They're so beautiful. And he's like, this, this whole thing is just going to, in a couple of years, really great delivery. Um, but, uh, and yet he presents uh, these signs in the midst of his foretelling of history repeating itself that his followers should watch and wait for these signs. When they occur, he says, to not stand in fear, but to stand up and lift up our heads, not to watch for our imminent destruction, but for our imminent hope. Our hope in the Son of Man's second coming on a cloud with power and great glory. In this season, though, we wait and anticipate Emmanuel, God with us, the season of Advent, how God enters the world incarnate for the first time, fully God and fully human, and so fully vulnerable. And every time the season rolls around, I'm so struck by how God chose to come into this world as a little infant. Have you ever had to take care of the needs of somebody who is like a person who is that small? You know that they need an incredible tenderness of care. And honestly, that just, it hits me every time that someone had to change God when God made a mess of God's self because God couldn't do it themselves. That's just so powerful that God would put themselves in our place, in a place of needing help and care. And I think in the season of Advent, we approach this tension between God's incredibly human vulnerability in the incarnation to institutions like organized religion, like the state, even his family, and God's later triumph over the very institution that would claim God's life. The advent of God's incarnation honors the reality that the power of God not subverts not just death, but life and how we live in the world. As followers of Christ, we are not beholden to the authority of earthly institutions. Our allegiance is not solely to any earthly institution. They are fallible. They are human-made. They will not last. That does not mean that they cannot be good or helpful. However, they are not deserving of our unchecked fealty and devotion. The same institution that convicts Sintoya Brown, a 16-year-old Black girl, to a life sentence for defending herself against the man who trafficked her also acquits Kyle Rittenhouse. These are dark times. We are seeing these institutions that swear that their intentions are just failing. Or maybe we're seeing them work the exact way that they're supposed to. Either way, I feel comfortable saying that this is not of God, and it is not right for us to live like this. Now, I'm not necessarily proposing anarchism, though if you're interested, I have a syllabus and yes, Tolstoy's on it. It's like what Ingrid and the band just sang, God, dear God of love, God almighty, God above, please look down and see my people through. It's that hope that we have, that no matter what our situation within an institution, there is a kingdom coming with greater power and greater glory than anything that has ever come before, anything that is, anything that ever will be. We will be seen through to the end, and that's our hope, our purpose behind our persistence. There is a God who triumphed over the most brutal system of death and affliction. And by the way, there's that line in the reading from the gospel that's a little tricky, that's a little touchy. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things have happened. And again, hope is the purpose behind your persistence. This is where that thing, what I just said that I asked you to remember, uh, comes in, having hope in Jesus, in the divine institution of salvation, uh, that is Christ, having hope that is persistent in its pursuit of his purpose. Institutions will fail us, is what Jesus has to teach his followers. Institutions will not save us. Why we keep going in light of the institution is the hope that there is a greater institution that shakes even the powers of heaven. But first, but first, God knows what it's like to be subjected to these earthly institutions. Not only do I spend Advent thinking about what God was going to experience as a human and just the miracle of Jesus's birth, but I also think about what it meant for God to live in community with humans for the first time since Eden and what it also meant for those humans. 
I think about Mary, all of her very carefully laid plans to be Joseph's wife, to care for her community, to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, to have Joseph's children, and how those plans were waylaid by the coming of an angel and the coming of the king at first. And I think about in those days after the angel, whether or not she could feel that Joseph planned to divorce her quietly. And I think she could. And I imagine her staring down the barrel of this unplanned pregnancy, wondering how on earth she was going to do this alone. And that little bit of tension before Joseph was like, I'm in this with you. I imagine her resolve, deciding that no matter the circumstances, she would persist because that's hope. God becoming incarnate this way as a baby knows that means that God knows what it's like to be caught in systems. Again, I know that these are honestly dark and troubled times for real. I don't think you need me to tell you that again. I'm, I might be like also outing myself as someone who wears a little tinfoil hat sometimes, but it feels like these are the signs that Jesus was talking about. Not necessarily that the world is going to end, but that we need to stand up and be unafraid. It's, you know, it's that funny feeling you get seeing Carol Baskins trending first on Twitter and climate change trending six, all these little uncanny moments, all these little signs that point to the cracks in the institutions and the way that we have done things. Because after all, that's what institutions are, are a means of doing something. But Jesus is clear, there is no fear to be had in that. There is only hope. We cannot be fatalistic. There is a greater kingdom coming. But first, its king knows what it's like to be held. And that's what we honor in this season of Advent. That hope comes first, not as a conquering king, but as an infant, as someone as badly in need of help as we all are. This Advent, especially this Advent, we celebrate what it means to hope in spite of broken institutions, broken promises, and just plain old brokenness. This Advent, we celebrate, despite everything going on, a quiet and humble anticipation of the arrival of our sweet Savior, that hope comes not, again, as a conqueror, but as a baby. It's this little hope that persists, that hope that at every turn defies odds and expectations. Hope is this wild thing that doesn't do what it's told, doesn't listen very well. Hope is a thing that needs nurturing. Hope is something that needs to be held and held carefully. Amen.